This is White Sands, New Mexico, 5,000 square mile tract of barren sun-baked wasteland. Lost in the vastness of the desert is a clump of low-lying buildings where the United States Army, Navy, and Air Force are carrying on a broad research program in the field of long-range rockets and guided missiles. No longer a weapon of war, the V-2 is doing an important post-war job in meteorological research, penetrating 100 miles above the Earth's surface to record scientific data. With the exception of special attachments that are manufactured in this country, the entire missile is constructed from parts made by the Germans before VE Day. Every detail of the Nazis' most closely guarded secret weapon is known to American technicians. Delicate instruments are put into the warheads of these V-2 rockets instead of explosives. These instruments are designed especially for each missile by the government agency for whom the rocket is fired. While most of the recording instruments and telemetering devices are placed in the warhead, some also go into the control compartment between the warhead and the fuel tanks. When the missile is completely assembled, it is weighed and its center of gravity determined. Without fuel, the rocket weighs five tons. The addition of nine tons of alcohol and liquid oxygen brings the gross takeoff weight to approximately 14 tons. When the rocket is ready to be taken to the firing range, it is placed on a vehicle called the Myler Wagon, which is specially designed to transport the missile and to seat its huge bulk on the launching platform. Extreme care is taken in transporting the missile from the assembly area to the firing range. The delicate control mechanism of the rocket is very easily damaged. A launching platform is brought into position to be engaged to the Myler wagon. Retaining clamps which hold the missile to the lifting frame are carefully checked. Mechanical jacks are employed to level the launching platform. A wooden working stage, which will be removed before launching, is placed over the blast deflector before seating the rocket. The missile is ready to be raised to a vertical position. The missile is not anchored to the platform in any way. Therefore, care must be taken to seat the rocket squarely. the rocket firmly seated, the retaining clamps on the lifting frame are released and the frame is lowered. Power for energizing the control system is carried to the missile through a ground connecting cable mast. The firing azimuth of the rocket is carefully set. Engineers use surveyor's transits to ensure that the rocket is vertical. To facilitate fueling and checking of the missile, a specially designed gantry crane is employed. Working platforms on the columns of the crane are lowered into position on either side of the missile. The last operation in the preparation of the rocket for firing is the loading of fuel. First, four tons of grain alcohol are pumped into the upper tank. In the 60 second burning period, nine tons of fuel will be consumed. Alcohol fueling has been completed. Approximately five tons of liquid oxygen are pumped into the lower tank. 380 pounds of hydrogen peroxide and 30 pounds of sodium permanganate are placed in the steam turbine pumping unit, which will operate the missile's fuel pumps. The gantry crane is withdrawn. Now the final weather and wind velocity checks are made. Over a radius of 17 miles, field stations are alerted, radar devices warmed up and adjusted, and special cameras readied. Hundreds of electrical control cables extend from the missile to a stoutly constructed blockhouse. Roofed with 27 feet of reinforced concrete, the blockhouse will protect the launching crew in the event of a misfire or explosion. 
Time is growing short. Control is assumed by the launching crew. Inside the blockhouse, a carefully planned schedule is followed. The chief proof officer is in constant contact with all field stations via telephone. The commandant at the proving ground makes a final check on the preparations for launching. Three minutes before launching is marked by a flare from a very pistol. Two minutes before launching. One minute. seconds, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, rocket away. Radar tracking devices swing into operation. Four seconds have elapsed. The rocket is now one mile up. Its sound is still deafening to the ear. Telescopic cameras follow the course of the missile. 60 seconds have elapsed. Automatic recorders spot signals from the rocket. Three minutes and 45 seconds have elapsed. The missile has reached its highest point, 100 miles above the Earth, more than 10 times higher than any airplane has ever flown. Radar technicians forward information to the blockhouse. A forecast is made of the location of the point of impact. The approximate location of the missile's impact is given to liaison pilots who will search for the fallen rocket. Observer sights the missile. He alerts the ground recovery party and arranges a rendezvous. The ground and air parties meet. The air party leads the way to the wreckage. circumstances, parts of the rocket are spread over a wide area. Careful search is made for all those recording instruments which were designed to withstand the shock of impact. But every part of the missile which can be located is carried back to the proving ground laboratories to be studied and analyzed. A conference of all technicians and supervisory personnel is held to discuss the performance of the missile. Reports given to the chief proof officer by the men in charge of the collection of data make it possible for him to correct and improve assembly and launching techniques in succeeding operations. By using the V-2 rocket as a test unit, an extremely valuable body of information on the characteristics and performance of guided missiles is being built up by the Army, Navy, and Air Force. But the armed forces are at the same time extending scientific knowledge into realms that have been hitherto unreachable. Out of the vastness of the New Mexico desert may come many miracles of tomorrow's science, contributing, let us hope, to mankind's welfare in a world at peace.